What's up, my friends? Welcome to Christian Podcast Live. I'm Beto Gudiño, and I bring you weekly Gente Chingona to talk about matters of Christianity and culture through the lens of emoji reactions that range from blasphemous to divine. So if you're Googling what does Chingona means, that's badass. <laughs> so what does it take to become a badass woman? We're about to find out. Rebecca, welcome to Christian Podcast Live. How are you doing? Very good. Muchas gracias, Beto. It's so good to be here with you. I'm thrilled to be here coming all the way from Austin, Texas. Awesome. Austin, Texas. Wow. Exciting. Okay. Yes. So this is what we're going to do right now. I have your book right here, Lost Girl, From the Hood to the White House to Millionaire Entrepreneur. And I'm going to have my emoji reaction to it. Okay, so for that, I'll go to my virtual background so you can see it. And I hope you can see it. So you can see my emojis. So if you see, okay, so there are my five emojis right there. And we're going to go to the gods of Emoji Tron to see what our reaction is going to be. You ready? <laughs> okay. Uh oh. Emoji Tombola. Reveal the emoji that we're gonna have today. Okay, the emoji tombola is black, but it's an inspired emoji, inspired emoji. All right, so Rebecca, how do you feel about getting an inspired emoji for Lost Girl? Hey, listen, I'll take it. Uh, my whole life has been an inspiration, uh, not only to me, I've walked it, uh, but also to many others. So I'm, I'm happy to continue to inspire uh, in my God story. Nice. Okay, so this is going to be an amazing episode. There's so much I want to ask about your, your journey. But let's talk about a little bit of how it all started. Okay, so I was reading the book. I was checking out um, a little bit of your background and your story. And what I love, I think today's like big idea is going to be once a victim, now a boss, because I love that. And I think we're going to talk about a little bit of where you've come from, uh, what does victimhood maybe might have looked like for you growing up, and what does becoming a boss means now, right? And how did you get there and what changed to get to that point? So I'm going to start with this. When you came into the world, it was because your biological dad was bisexual. Can you? I mean, that already can kick us off with how your journey started into this world. <laughs> well, I uh, I had a pretty, um, I, I always say jacked up beginning. You know, we all have jacked up pasts and families and issues, but mine was mine would take the cake for jacked up. I'm one of four kids um, from a border town of, called El Paso. And none of us knew our fathers. My my biological father, who I never met, was the owner of a club in Juarez my mom was a dancer at. So she always used to say, hey, you know, you were a one night stand and out of out of the one night stand came came Rebecca. And in, in all honesty, it was uh, later on in life, we would joke about it and, you know, laugh about it. But it was really tragic for me as a daughter and as a child and a teenager growing up with such dysfunction. So we were we lived in abject poverty. I call it below ground zero. Mom was addicted to heroin and drugs and uh, dr other drugs of her choice and through the entire time that she raised us uh, up until I was nine years old she had an issue with drug addiction and uh, was in and out of the house gone a lot you know left us a lot with my grandmother and so I'm, I'm really a miracle to be alive today and I always tell people you know never ever think that where you started is where you can finish because there's always the trajectory that you owned to change so uh, you know, I made a decision at age 19 to put a stake in the ground and change my future, but I had a, a just a tragic upbringing. The first three chapters of my book, Beto, talk about how I was born in failure. Uh, my first chapter is called Born in Failure, and uh, I talk about that journey, but it was very painful, and out of that uh, came a lot of issues with my self-esteem or lack of, uh, issues of drug addiction on my own personal choices that I made, a teen mom, a dropout, the whole bit, you name it, I did it. Wow. And I'm I'm assuming a lot of people can relate to that nowadays. Um, you know, as we see, I mean, the world is kind of like in chaos and America has its own issues. And I think 
you have a lot to speak on, especially like in, in terms of like womanhood and your upbringing. And as a Latina too, you know, I think there's a lot, I, I, I mean, a lot of inspiration. So uh, let's talk about, let's, let's dig a little bit into your past. You know, let's talk about those those elements of maybe victimhood that when you were growing up, like you mentioned, you know, poverty. Um, well, in, in the book, you talk about teen pregnancy, dropping out of high school, unstable home life, no father figure, addictions, dysfunction. I mean, like all kinds of chaotic situations that I feel yeah. like a lot of people can resonate with today. So out of, I mean... <laughs> When you grew up, like, what was victimhood um, like yeah, for you? So, I mean, we, you know, because mom had men in and out of the house all the time, none of us knew our fathers, and um, she she had an issue, you know. Uh, we grew up, uh, I was sexually abused at age five, age five, so, you know, I always tell people addiction, abuse, mental illness, dysfunction, poverty, you name it. There's no excuse why when you have those elements you grow up in, why you have to stay there. And at some point in my life, I had to make the decision again to become a victor and not stay as a victim. I was recently talking to some Latina girls here in the inner city in Austin. We're scholarshiping uh, seven of the girls to help them go to college. And I was telling them, look, you don't have to remain in your in your situation. If you have a, a troubled past or you have troubled situation in your home life, you know, when, when you turn 18 and you can, you, you make your own decisions, you can really change the trajectory of your life by staying in school, by ensuring you're making those healthy, right choices that are going to lead you to a better future. And so my story, Beto, is, is non, no different than a lot of the American story. Uh, it's an American dream story because at age 19, so, so I would, I got pregnant at 17 dropped out of school. Uh, back then there were there were no alternatives for going to high school pregnant. You know, if you were mm. pregnant, you dropped out. And uh, my mother had, uh, when I was nine years old, my mother rehabbed and she uh, got her life on track and moved us to Austin, Texas and tried to be a mom at that point. And, but, you know, I had gone almost my whole childhood without that, that, that engagement with her and without trusting her. I had a lot of hate in my heart for her. Um, and, you know, because of that, I didn't trust anybody in my life. And I had been abused by men, by family members and just didn't trust anybody. And so she had a really tough time with me as a teenager. I started using drugs at age 13 and got in a bunch of trouble, then got pregnant. But one of the things she did, Bethel, that I always talk, and this is where God's redemption power is so powerful, because when she gave her heart to God and said, God, I want to do life different and I want to help my daughter, she had realized she had failed. And she would say, Miha, I failed you in life, but I'm praying and I'm asking God to do a miracle in your life because he cannot fail. And I'm trusting him with you. She gave me to the Lord and trusted the Lord with my life. She took care of my daughter so that the system, foster system wouldn't take her away from me. Um, I talk about in, in chapter three about getting involved with the baby daddy who almost killed me and he was a big drug dealer. And mom was with me through those tragedies and really stood by my side and believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. So it was this relationship of almost um, split personality with her because when we were kids, she was jacked up and jacked us up. And then when she gave her heart to God and got her life on track, she really wanted to make a difference and she wanted to show me a different path. And even though it was difficult for her, she was still in poverty. She struggled a lot with mental illness, Bethel. So even as a Christian, she struggled a lot with mental illness, never really got help for that. So there was still a lot of dysfunction in our in our home, um, but she tried to help me. And one of the ways was by taking my daughter and raising her for the first year. I didn't end up getting her back until I was 19 years old when I got my own life on track. But my mom actually took me to church one day. I was 19 and said, Miha, you know, uh, there's a powerful God who can change your life and 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 will never fail you. And, and you need to give your life to him. So that spiritual encounter and that God moment that I had at the point of my mess and my complete rock bottom. So I say people, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom. Unfortunately, my rock bottom, God was there and he transformed my life in a big way. Wow. Amazing. And for sure, I think we're going to get into that rock bottom piece and how God intervened. And this is a Christian podcast. So I love it when, you know, people talk about their faith and talk about how God maybe played a role in their transformation. But even as you were talking about Uh, encouraging other girls in your community and becoming, I guess, moving out of the victimhood mentality. So this strikes me, you know, as a, you know, as I mentioned, like a Christian podcast, like I've been reading the story in, I think it's in Luke. Well, it's in several, 
in several of the Gospels. But anyways, the story where Jesus says that there was a father who had two sons, right? And one son goes on and squanders like all the inheritance. He says, give it to me the money. And he goes out and spends it on prostitutes and this and that, right? And here's an interesting point about the story that I've heard from other people that I have it on the show where they talk about a lot of people when they read the story, they glance over the fact that it says there was a famine in the land where this young man squandered his money, right? And sometimes, I mean, I, I would love for you to give us a little bit of insight into yeah. what does the circumstances have to do in in that mentality of victimhood? Like, is, is there ever a situation where things are really out of your control, right? That I mean... Is that real? Does that right. really it, happen? It is. And, and you know, most most of life is out of our control, right? Look at, listen, we've been in this pandemic for two years and the shit has hit the fan and everybody's struggling. And, you know, we're all just wanting, you know, to move forward and we can't control life. And so that's how it was for me. I couldn't control the elements of my mother's dysfunction or all the things she brought into the home to, to created the abuse. Uh, but, but Bethel, again, I had to make a decision. And for me, it happened at age 19. Um, you know, very early on in my life that I hated living in poverty. I hated standing in line every year for school, getting my shoes from the Salvation Army. And I, I'm all for government assistance, but my mother was a habitual lifelong welfare recipient. And, you know, welfare is not meant to be a lifelong benefit, right? <laughs> we're, we're supposed to get the help we need and then yeah. get off of welfare and go contribute. And so I grew up in that environment where, where mom was on welfare her whole life. I hated that. I grew up in, in, a, in a lack of trust, you know, uh, abuse. Um, I, I had to make the decision that, you know, I'm tired of being a victim. I'm tired of having life happen to me. I would like to be the driver of my own future. And in order to drive my own future, what that looked like for me, Beto, is number one, I had to surrender my life to God because guess what? As powerful as, as I am today in terms of my thinking and I'm a very positive person, I still need God every day and he guides my path. My spiritual walk with the Lord is central to who I am today. It's central to my transformation the last 30 years. And for me, it's been a process of walking my healing out. It took me 10 years, Bethel, to forgive my mom. I hated her and had hate in my heart. I had to work through forgiveness. I had to go to the word of God to teach what does forgiveness look like. Um, I had to work through hate. I had to work through forgiveness of myself or my own stupid choices, right? So, you know, life happens to us. But we can get in the driver of our own seat and whatever is in the span of our control, we should do our best to surrender it to God and say, hey, you know, I want a better, a, a better path. Maybe that's going back to school. Maybe that's getting out of debt. Maybe that's making right choices in the men or the women that you pick to be in your life. Relationships are central to your success. Quit picking bad people to be in your life because they're going to drag you down. So it's all those little choices that although we can't control the elements, we can be the driver of our future. Wow. Okay. So helping people make better choices regardless of the circumstances they're in. So what was, I mean, God, you already mentioned like God as the one transformative element. Could people yeah. be transformed? Could people transform their, their poverty right into success or their, their tragic background or past into a hopeful future without God? Well, it's possible. Hey, there's a lot of successful people out there that, that don't proclaim to be Christians. And I, you know, I, I, I believe for me, it required God, but it also required, guess what? I had to go back to school. I had to get my GED. I enrolled in a welfare to work program for a woman by the name of Ann Richards, who's a famous governor here in Texas for the first time in my life. And I talk about that story working for Ann. I saw a woman in power. She wasn't barefoot pregnant or, you know, in poverty. And as a Latina, I said, hey, I want to be like her. I want to be a leader. What does that look like? Guess what? I had to enroll in leadership classes. I had to start learning how to communicate, get rid of my East Side slang. I had to learn to, to <laughs> I went back to school and started getting education. Uh, education is empowerment. Um, and, and listen, God's not going to drop something from the sky and poof, everything's fixed overnight. But it was those deliberate steps that I took. I met my husband, um, who I've been married to for 32 years. He's 10 years older than me. He was a huge 
huge visionary. He pushed me, Beto, to deal with my junk. And he pushed me to, to embrace learning. He, he's been an avid learner his whole life. And so you have to take ownership. This is what I'm talking about. When, you, when I say own your future and be in the driver's seat of your future, that requires you taking steps. God can give you favor and forgiveness and blessing, but he's not, he's not going to wave a magic wand from heaven and fix everything for you, right? You got to own your own decisions. Wow. I love that. Own your own decisions. Wow. Okay. So when you say hitting rock bottom, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, as, as I'm trying to compare this a little bit with the, the story of the prodigal son, right, that we... I'm sure most people have heard of, but if not, just go to the Gospels and it's right there. It's short, it's nice, and it's sweet. And so anyways, this guy goes and squanders the money. And in a sense, once he realizes that he is living, like you're saying, right? He's living in poverty. He's, he's getting fed the, the same food that the pigs are getting fed. Um, he realizes that he had it pretty good with his father back, back home. And he decides that it's time for him to go back. So tell me a little bit, like, I, I know in the book, like, you even talk about, like, losing your virginity, right? At, at a, age, course, 13, at a young, yeah. age 13. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, tell me about those elements of hitting rock bottom. What did it mean for you? Like, what, what did it look like when you were in that stage? Yeah, listen, I I, uh, I talk about a, just a tragic uh, loss of my virginity at age 13 to a man that was um, in his 20s and he took advantage of me. But you know, I didn't love myself, Bethel. I didn't I didn't value myself. I grew up not knowing who I was. So when I discovered who I was in Christ and that I had purpose, there's a scripture that I love, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Go figure. God wants us to have a future. But those victims, uh, milestones for me that were just rock bottom milestones um, in terms of my depth that I had sunk to, they, they didn't just happen once or twice, they kept happening again and again. And again, I had to make a decision at age 19 to say, I'm not going to be sexually abused anymore or put myself in a situation to be sexually abused. I'm going to take ownership of my own future. And I stopped hanging out. I cut all those negative influences out of my life, Bethel, that were causing me to be in an element and putting myself in situations that were not healthy for me. And listen, I think sometimes, and, I, and, and I'm talking about some family too, right? You know, as Joel Osteen says, some family you just gotta love from a distance and see them once or twice a year <laughs> because they're so toxic and they're your family, but they're just toxic. And so I had to make decisions for a period of time where I could get my own healing to cut certain people out of my life that were just toxic for me. And, um, and then once I got strong and once I got my mentoring and my counseling and started getting my healing, then I can come back around and outreach to those family members that I love to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm better now. I want you to be better. Stay off drugs. You know, my twin brother is a good example of that. I have a twin brother, Beto, who is a drug addict. He's addicted to methamphetamine. Um, he struggles with trans transgender um you know, uh, identity. And, and it's usually cause he's on meth. Um, cause he talks about how he's now this woman on meth. Um, but I've tried to get him to stop doing drugs and he won't, I can't help my brother. I would love to snap my fingers and say, please change. Cause I changed, but he keeps going back to that mess and that addiction that is just toxic for him. And so I have to love him from a distance at times cause he's dangerous. And, you know, sometimes in life, I think that we have to make really wise choices on who we're surrounding ourselves with because I have, I have to evaluate, does that relationship align with where I'm going in my future or is it going to take me and drag me into my past? And sometimes that means changing those relationships. I just did a reset you for 2022 series, Beto. It's on my website at RebeccaContreras.com. I focus seven weeks on resetting you. And I talk about resetting relationships, resetting toxicity, resetting communication, reset in every, every, every of your life. And reset relationships for me was a huge movement forward in my progress. And, and you know, obviously I, I uh, ended up working for a president. I worked for uh, George W. Bush and went to the White House with him and had a lot of success. My husband and I both actually, we were one of the only um, Latino married couples in the administration. So we're really wow. proud of having served together. Um, but, you know, started my business and surrounded myself with entrepreneurs and said, hey, I want to be a business owner too. That would be great. I can do that. 
and started learning the business. And who would have known that 10 years ago when I started the business, here we are, 100 person practice, very successful today. So, you know, all those decisions that I'm talking about, uh, Beto, really are important for you to make them deliberate and for them to lead you to the next step of where you want to go in your purpose with your goals. Wow. Awesome. And, you know, there's a phrase that we have in Spanish and maybe you can help me translate it if you, if no, I'm sure you've heard it, right? But it says, el que con lobos anda, aullar se enseña. Have you heard that phrase? I actually haven't. I know, I know, I, I've heard con lobos anda is if you walk with wolves, right? Yes. Um, but yeah, I haven't. That's the first time I've heard of it. But oh, wow. You are a product of your relationships for mm. sure. Yes. Okay. So what you're telling me right now, and this is, this is so good because I feel like there, I, there is a tension, right? Because I think at the same time we are to love everybody. It's like, where is the thin line between helping someone and, and the line of we, we, I don't need the help. I don't even want the help. I'm addicted to this and there's no way to help people who don't want help. Yeah. Right. So that, I mean, that's, that's super well, sad. I, and I think, I think you have to help yourself before you help mm. anybody else. Like I had to start with me, Rebecca Contreras, help myself. I need to make myself better so that then I can be a help to others. My husband and I have a nonprofit here in Austin. We reach out to thousands of inner city kids. So I'm talking about helping yourself and loving yourself enough to want to help yourself change. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I think that's key in, in this situation, like this guy coming out of, no, the, the, the parable of the prodigal the son, of right? So he coming out of this, this desolate, desperate, hopeless future. I love the phrase, he came to his senses mm -hmm. and thought, I need to go back to my father and ask forgiveness, right. right? And that, I mean, the forgiveness part is like a whole other story that's beautiful. So as as you encounter like this, this, I guess, decision of I got to get out of poverty, like I hate being poor, I hate making the line and, you know, asking for, for help um, and moving forward, like how was that? Uh, forgiving yourself and and yeah how did forgiveness to yourself help you maybe even start forgiving other people like forgiving your mom for giving the people that yeah. like you said had a kind of like brought you into the chaotic childhood yeah so I'm a big proponent of counseling Beto um I'm talking about traditional counseling. Um, you, do you know that only 19% of the Latino community gets counseling and help for mental illness or trauma or abuse, um, the, 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 the rates of people that don't get counsel. I, I, I'm a big proponent of that. That's, I got a lot of counseling, but I didn't realize that I had so much hate and unforgiveness until I started talking to somebody about it and realized that I, that I didn't trust. And it started Beto early on in my marriage when I didn't trust my husband and I had to figure out where the root came from, right? I don't trust him. So where's the root? I don't trust men. I don't trust anybody. So for me, it was about getting that counseling and then taking those steps to walk out God's word and allowing people to mentor me, pastors and leaders and people that had, had done life uh, better than me at the time, right? You have to be able to look up. Listen, if you don't have people in your life you can look up to that are doing better than you, then get other people in your life. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had a lot of people that I could look up to that helped me. And um, and obviously, the uh, I'm, I'm an insatiable learner. I love absorbing content. So listening to, you know, podcasts, listening to sermons, you know, doing self, uh, reading self-help books. There's a great book that I, um, I embraced early on in my life uh, by Dr. Leaf, Think, Learn, Succeed. And she's a neuroscientist. She talks about the power of the brain to really trigger negative thinking and how that negative toxic thinking results in physical outcome. Like there's a physical consequence to negative thinking and it affects your body. It affects your, your career. It affects your relationships. So I just, uh, I really am an insatiable learner for really, I wanted to do everything different. When I, when I, um, and my story is vast, the whole, the whole story is in Lost Girl, the book, um, I'm giving you the, you know, 50,000 foot version, but Betha, when I first became a millionaire, You look back and I saw myself, literally, I remember 15 years ago, um, someone telling me, you know, Rebecca, you're such a hard worker. You're so, you're so smart. One day you're going to be a millionaire. I was like, wow, is that possible? Uh, I guess it is. I want to be a millionaire. And why do I want to be a millionaire? It's not because I want 
to have a bunch of money. It's because I want it for impact. My husband and I are able to give back to the community and we're able to help thousands of kids and you know people and, and pay it forward. Um, I love to be able to go back and say, hey, listen, I did it. I, I wanna help you get out of that situation. So now I'm a mentor to many uh, young women and have mentored in my life because I've had mentors mentor and, and, and have impact me personally. So I believe God gives us success for a purpose, Bethel. And it's usually not just so that we can live in big houses and drive nice cars. It's usually so that we can turn around and do good with it. Um, you know, the, the, the prodigal son story I relate to, I was a prodigal daughter. Uh, you know, my poor mom, I put her through hell when, um, when I was a teenager and she had already rehabbed by that point, because she rehabbed when I was nine and gave her heart to God, but I put her through hell Mm -hmm. and, you know, she stood by me and believed in me. And so I have, I resonate with that prodigal son story, but there are many prodigal sons and daughters in the U S right now. And maybe it's not traditional prodigal and spiritual sense. Maybe it's you're lost in your career. You've lost your job, you know, COVID changed things for everybody. Maybe you don't know where you're going in your purpose, but I would encourage your listeners to seek help and grab their life by the horns and figure out what that goal and what that path is. And if you don't know what it is for you, then find someone who can help you figure out what that is, right? Because I'm a a big believer that you have to be able to talk to people who are smarter than you, who can help you do life better. We just need each other. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing insight. And Here's one thing I love about even, you know, just like right now talking to you and for the people that will be watching. um, Normally, I talk to people and they have books in their background or the library or things like that. And what I'm seeing behind you right now is, I mean, there's a Wonder Woman somewhere in there, right? (laughs) There she is. This is my reminder (laughs) of who I'm meant to be in my stand. (laughs) Nice. I love that. And I love, you know, there's the, the seal of the president of the United States. Why are those uh, dollar bills? So I was an official and executive at the Department of Treasury. And this oh. is a sheet of money. Wow. And I actually have had this uh, back when I was a government worker. I got this. And I keep it on my desk to remind me that money has purpose. Mm. And uh, money is not, it, money's great, but you got to have purpose with money. And my purpose is laser focused to give back to the community. Wow. That's amazing. So you have the seal of the United States behind you and you work with George W. Bush, right? Yes. In his, during his administration. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, I want to know about the work you did there, but also I think first, This is what I want to know. Like, how did you know doors were opening and also like when to walk through those doors? How do we know? Listen, I I have had so many amazing people that I have met in my career that I've worked super hard with and that I've been able to, you know, if if the the work hour, if the work day required an eight hour day, then I'm putting in a 10 hour day. Um, If if my first job was a secretary in that welfare to work program where I answered phones for Ann Richards, who later became the governor, I made sure that every single time I answered those phones, I answered it with the biggest smile and the biggest, you know, uh, positive attitude. And, you know, I raised my hand as a secretary, you know, I always volunteering for projects. And so as I started my government career at the at the rock bottom people began to notice Rebecca works really hard and she always, and she always, she never says no to any task. She never, never says no. She's always raising her hand to volunteer. And then they started sending me to school and I worked for a woman by the name of Kay Bailey Hutchison um, and worked my way up in government. I started in that welfare to work program as a receptionist. When I left government, I was working um, for President Bush, uh, handling about 1200 positions and hiring for him. Uh, I got to I got to work for President Bush for 12 years, six years here in Texas and six years in D.C. But listen, Beto, people notice people notice when you work hard and they notice when you're you're lear- you're wanting to learn. I don't have a traditional degree, but I had a lot of people in my life that believed that I was smart and that and, and that promoted me and sent me to school. I volunteered for special tasks. Nothing was, I never had a negative attitude, got rid of the negative thinking, negative stinking thinking. Um, and I think uh, I caught people's, the right people's attention by working really hard. And one of those was uh, elect uh, President Bush when he was elected. 
Mm. So how was that? Like, how, how do you get his attention by your hard work? Well, so I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I remember uh, being in the governor's office. I was the director of, of human resources, so HR. And um, I remember um, I had, there were two issues with employees that, uh, that worked in the governor's office. And one of, the, one of the issues centered around one of his immediate staff members. And I remember, um, you know, handling that situation with kit gloves, very, very politically, you know, making sure that I was taking care of that person and, um, you know, and making sure that I helped her get a job. Um, she wasn't the right fit for the job that she was in and the governor was trying to take care of her. And I raised my hand to say, I'll take care of her. I'll, I'll, I'll help her do her resume. I'll sit down and help her find another job. I made some phone calls in the state and was able to, um, to help, help her go do something else. And he remembered that. I remember he showed up in my office one day um, and he knocked on the door and he came and he said, I want to personally thank you for the way you handled that personnel issue. Wow. Because you cared about her. It wasn't just, oh, she's not a fit, fire her, get rid of her. But you took great care to make sure that you left her whole in that process. You know, and what I mean by that is instead of firing her, I helped her get another job because I believe everybody wants to be successful, Bethel. I don't believe problem employees, you know, as an employer now, you know, I make sure that everybody's set up for success. And if they're not successful in their job with me, then maybe I can help them be successful in another job. But I, I put a lot of uh, care and, 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 and uh, love around supporting people and where they want to go in their goals. And I think that caught his attention. Uh, it also, you know, I, I network, I'm a really good networker and I bring people to the table that, um, you know, people are very powerful when you have a strong network and I'm able to bring people to the table to get things done. And I think he noticed that, but, um, since we're talking about president Bush, he recently wrote me. So he read my book, lost girl. I did nice. not give it to Wow. I don't, have, I don't have access to him, but he read my book. Somebody gave it to him awesome. and I got a personal handwritten note. This is, this is how amazing this man is. For him to take the time to write me a personal note and mail it to my home, my home. I haven't seen him in 15 years, uh, but he he said, I want you to know I read your book. I did. I knew you had a pass, but wow, you, you really took the cake on that one. <laughs> but I want to know how, how I want you to know how proud I am that you that you you know, did it in life. And I thought, well, he's proud of me. Wow. That's a big deal. But he just took the care. So, you know, I learned my leadership resolve from president Bush, uh, under the 12 years that I served in him. He's, he's a very resolved leader. There's not a lot that shakes him emotionally. You won't ever catch him losing his shit on TV or, you know, calling someone out. He's very methodical in his leadership style and, and he cares about people. And so I, I like in my, my own leadership style around learning those traits from him. Wow, that in incredible. So learning leadership from the president of the United States and even you know, as, I, as I was reading, I mean, it, it was kind of like when when the Twin Towers uh, fell, right? Like in 2001. So around that era, how do you think that shaped um, the future of leadership in America, like for the president and maybe even for, for the rest of the world, like how did leadership have to change? Well, listen, I was in the White House when 911 hit. I was evacuated to a secure location with a lot of the other commissioned officers that worked for him. Wow. And um, I tell the whole 911 story in a whole chapter called DC, D DC Chaos. And it was so chaotic. But listen, Beto, a week after 911, uh, so I was meeting with the president back then twice a week. Um, and I tell some cool stories in my book about Oval Office experience and stuff, but we didn't think we'd ever see him again because he was focused on, on um, you know, the whole Iraq thing and the war. And we thought, well, my stuff is personnel. It's not going to be that important to him. You know, he's probably going to be caught up with DOD and the Department of Defense. And a week to the day, um, we got called to a meeting in the Oval and I got to walk in that Oval Office with my boss. And I didn't know how to, how was I going to address him? How was I going to talk to him? I remember sitting there, Beto. I tell the full story in my book and just immediately, immediately he looked at us and he said, I want to thank you for coming back. And I want to thank you for serving in this trying time. Because wow. a lot of people didn't come back the next day to the White House. It was quite scary. And he was there. He was thanking us. And so we I, I, I chimed up and I said, Mr. President, I want you to know we're praying for you. And he looked at me and he said, you keep praying and you tell everybody you know to pray because we're going to need a miracle. He recognized, Bethel, that he was just a man 
and that it was going to take a miracle to deal with what happened with 911. And I think the honest of that office of the presidency, regardless of your political affiliation, anybody who sits in that office, we as Americans have to pray for our president. We have to understand they're under tremendous tremendous pressure and they're just men they're just women right they're human and so they need that supernatural and all through the times of the bible we see where god came around men and women of god that were raised to leadership and gave them that supernatural power to deal with the stuff that's happening and so i just i was honored to serve president bush and i i would encourage your listeners to you know it's easy to criticize the president there's a lot of stuff happening right now why don't we pray for the president and let's ask god to help guide the president uh, because we don't know what that man or woman in that office is dealing with until we until we, we sit there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. And for sure, a call to prayer. And I, I mean, the Bible says to pray for the authorities right over us. And even, you know, I, I love the fact that we ought to pray for them regardless of, of our political affiliation. So speaking exactly. of that a little bit, you know, I'm. I'm an immigrant in the United States, so I would love for you to speak a little bit about, like, what's your, um, like, how do you feel about, even as I read the book, it's like, you are the the embodiment of the American dream, right? Yeah. So, first of all, it's like, do you think the American dream is still alive, it's still attainable, it's still a thing? Oh, my gosh. Bethel, America is the greatest country in the world. We are still a land of opportunity and we are blessed of God in that way in so many ways. But we have to understand America's not perfect. Um, uh, as you may know, President Bush was a big proponent of passing Im comprehensive immigration reform. He tried to do it. I saw him literally, I saw him work with Democrats while he was in office to try to do comprehensive immigration reform. And I remember the day that that, that the Republicans killed his bill um, that he worked so hard to put together with uh, Ted Kennedy and John McCain and some of the other leaders at the time. And I remember him saying it was one of the saddest days in his career that he was not able to pass comprehensive immigration reform. And to this day, no president has been able to do it. But we need it. We need it. We there. Listen, there's so many people that are here that bring such richness to our country. I'm a big uh, proponent of embracing the um, the American dream for the immigrant, and we're a country of immigrants. I mean, literally, every I think everybody has some immigrant blood in them at some point. Uh, but it's so important for us to ensure we do it right. Um, that we that we put the right policies in place and. Um, I'm just, uh, I, I believe America is uh, the land of opportunity. And I would encourage everybody that's here, American or immigrant, you know, work hard, go to school, you know, make good choices, serve in your community, in your church, give back, you know, make make our country um, a, 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 a place where people are proud to be. Because for me, it is a great American, United States of America. You cannot get me to say anything bad about this country, Bethel. This country has been been so amazing to our family um, and 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 I know the history of the country and how we were founded with godly principles and I just hope that as a country we go back to that place of our founding and remember that God has to be the center of this great United States of America wow okay so what do you I mean if you are an entrepreneur I can't imagine that you have traveled the world in Even as you say, you know, like you love America. I'm from Mexico. I'm from Guadalajara. And I've only been to Mexico and the United States. You know, so I, I mean, I can tell the difference between those two. But what have you witnessed in terms of like maybe even like the world oh, that gosh. makes America have, special? Yeah. So I will tell you, we've been. Um, so my first plane ride uh, at age 21 was my honeymoon because I had never left uh, Texas and never been on a plane um, until I got married. But we've traveled the world. My husband and I have been to Lisbon. We've been to Paris. We've been to Italy, Greece. We've been to Rome. We've been um, all parts of Mexico. I'm a big Mexico traveler. We love Mexico and um, Guadalajara. We've been to uh, Mexico City, Playa del Carmen, you know, all you name it, we've been there. So I'm a world traveler now, uh, Beto. I have been, and 
Um, I love to travel not only the world, but also the country um, and various states just to meet people and, and get to know them. Uh, I launched my book from El Paso um, and got to meet about 600 amazing Latina entrepreneurs and business women who have great stories. And so I love hearing people's stories. Um, and so I, I always encourage people, you know, you'll only grow, grow by the books that you read and the places you go. And, uh, you know, even if you can't these days, getting in your car to travel is expensive with all the gas prices going up. But, uh, but I will tell you, having traveled the world everywhere I have been, and I've been a lot of places, I hear over and over again how much people love America and how people wish they were here. And so we're not this a horrible, you know, country that doesn't value people. I mean, we are a great country. Do we have progress we have to make? Yes, but we can't lose sight of all the progress that we've already made and how this country is such a rich opportunity for anybody that's here can be successful in America. I have personal friends who are immigrants who are also millionaires. And when they came as immigrants, they were janitors. They couldn't keep, you know, pay their bills. And now they're multimillionaire entrepreneurs. Only in America can an immigrant come out of this country, be part of the country, and then become an entrepreneur and a millionaire. Only in America. What other country produces that? Nowhere. Wow. Oh, you're giving me hope. So I like that. <laughs> you know, as an immigrant, oh, that's so good. Okay, so let's talk about, in, in the book, you have five core drivers. And I think it's, um, let's just maybe like... Uh, Deseverarlos. I'm just using my yeah. Spanish right now a little bit. So you have faith, capacity, hard work, mentor, advisors, and vision. So yes. uh, tell me a bit first, like, tell me what are these five core drivers? Well, so um, I, I like uh, analogies, right? I like to be able to take a thought and, and, and carry it all the way through uh, to a practical analogy. And so You know, I, again, my whole thing is get in the driver's seat of your own future. That's my message. And you be the driver. So there are five core drivers in life um, that in order for you to drive your future, for me, these are central. This is how Rebecca, uh, you know, drove her future. And the first one is uh, faith. You know, faith plays a huge role. Listen, without faith um, and without vision, people perish. And We've seen what has happened when you lose faith in something. Um, look at what's happened with COVID. So many Americans lost faith in our government because of all of this craziness of what's happened. And, you know, you saw so much chaos come out of that, you know, just chaos. Um, I'm a big believer in, 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 in ensuring that, that you have the capacity to embrace faith. For me, it's about faith in God. Um, I, I'm not one to say that, you know, the other religions out there aren't, you know, effective, uh, but you have to have faith in, in something bigger than you, bigger, a bigger power. Again, for me, it's about God and having the capacity to embrace faith, not only in saying, I'm going to be a woman of faith and I'm going to accept Jesus and I'm going to accept God, but it's also in walking out my faith, Bethel, when everything hits the fan and things go wrong, holding on to the principle that with God, with man, things are impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. And in learning the scriptures of faith that, that play a center core driver in my life. Mm, so good. Okay. Capacity. Well, listen, I always say God gives you, when you start in life, he gives you four feet of space. And I literally say you have four feet of space around you right here of influence and your ability to increase your capacity on how much more influence you're going to have determines how you manage that four feet of space, right? Mm. So I call it manage your life and get your stuff together so that God can then increase your capacity. We are made in the image of God. We are, uh, because we have, you know, when Jesus said he's, he literally were made in his image, He wasn't joking. That means we have God capacity in us through the spirit of God and through applying those principles that are in God's word as the blueprint. And there's nothing we can't achieve. Um, again, it's, it's having the ability to, to increase your capacity to say, you know, and, and for me, think about it. I'm, I go from being welfare on poverty, drug addiction to now a millionaire entrepreneur. So there was a 32 year journey along the way where, Each step I took increased my capacity, increased my knowledge, increased content in your head, 
change your thinking. It's that increase of capacity that really gives you the ability to really have that be a core driver. And I believe God wants to bless you. I believe for your listeners that God wants to bless you, but he's not going to do it if you don't manage that four feet of space properly and make sure you're making right choices and you're also increasing your capacity and knowledge. Knowledge is power. And I always tell people, have an insatiable appetite for learning. You know, pick up a book, listen to a podcast, a TED Talk, take a class. Um, You know, learning, it increases your capacity and allows you then to be a better businesswoman, a better career woman, a better mom, a better wife in every area of your life. Wow. So good. Okay. We're going to skip hard work because you kind of like already talked about it and mentor advisors and let's go to vision. Um, Vision. Vision. Listen, without a vision, my people perish. That's what the scripture says. Uh, If you don't have a vision for your life, then get a vision for your life. And I call it, I, I say, do it one step at a time. Let it start with your own personal health. Um, you know, what's the vision for your own personal health? Do you want to lose weight? Are you working out? You know, with COVID now, we've got to be healthy because anytime virus is hit, we know our body's going to respond better if we're healthy. I do a whole series on my website on reset your health. And I talk about the holistic self. Um, so you've got to be able to, um, to take those steps um, and ensure that you have a vision for your marriage, for your children, for your family, for your career, for your own faith journey and and write your vision down. I'm a big journaler. I Listen, I will go back and write every January, I write down my goals and my vision and then I go back and read it and I see what I accomplished and I'm so encouraged that, you know, sometimes I accomplish everything on the list and sometimes I don't, but at least I'll have one accomplishment. And without a vision, you cannot get out of your current situation. You've got to have the four wife vision to see yourself as a successful person, as a successful wife, at, you know, married, uh, you know, in a family with, with kids, you know, that aren't necessarily always making good choices, but you know, Hey, you're there to help them navigate through that. And so vision applies to every area of your life without a vision, people die. Mm, Wow. Were you ever afraid of success? So the only thing that I feared Bethel was failure because I had so much failure in my life. Um, And I also feared uh, I was intimidated by because I didn't value myself and I didn't feel that I had any worth. I was always intimidated um, that people would find out who I was um, and mm-hmm. what my past was. And then to say, Oh, you got to leave now because especially when you're working in the white house, I tell the whole story in there of my secret service clearance is a hairy, hairy sto- uh, <laughs> story where I talk about how I made almost didn't make secret service clearance. So all of that I've had to own and I've had to own the decisions and the choices and the things that I've had to make and and then tell myself, I'm not going to fear failure because failure is actually good sometimes because guess what? We only learn from failure. Mm -hmm. Um, And I call it a failing forward strategy where if you fail in life and you will, you're going to pick yourself up. You're going to dust yourself off, figure out what you did to, to, get to that failure and then do it different. Uh, but we learn through failure and I, I, I'm a big believer in failing forward. Wow. I love that failing forward. Okay. So this is what we're going to do, Rebecca. We are going to the summary through emoji reactions. So to summarize today's episode from your vantage point, what would be the most blasphemous idea, the worst idea when it comes to pursuing your dream, your goal, your vision? Um, in, in an emoji? Yes. What is the worst idea you can think of to, yeah, so for people to pursue I- their dream? The worst idea would be um, shame on me if I have all of this success and I don't, I stand before God one day And I don't hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Shame on me if I squander it and live for myself and don't give back. That is blasphemous. Wow. Love it. Okay. So let's move on to skeptical. What are you skeptical of? Um, 
Hmm. I'm an analyzer of people. I, I, I'm in the people business, HR. And so sometimes I analyze people too much and I, I try to see what their motive is. And, um, and sometimes that can be good, Beto, but sometimes it can be bad because you can misjudge people. Mm. And so, you know, I think for me, uh, I'm working really hard in 2022 not to be so skeptical about people and to be more trusting uh, because not everybody, you know, is in it to, to you know, get one up on you. Um, and so I've, I've, I've tried to embrace people where they are and love people where they are without forcing them to change if they're not capable of changing you know love people where they are so good okay um inspired where have you found inspiration lately uh, i'm inspired every day when i get to see my grandchildren i have two grandbabies my husband and i Uh, we're actually celebrating next week our 32 year anniversary. We're going to California to Santa Barbara to travel there nice. to have fun. But when I see my grandkids, my grandson just walked and he took his first steps in my kitchen. When I saw him walk last week, I was like, wow, nothing else matters in the world except watching that little baby have the confidence to take those first steps. And now he's running all over the place. But uh, I'm inspired because children have such innocence to them. And sometimes right now in the world, we need that. We need to come back to that innocence of children and, and love people where they are and, and celebrate the little things like taking those first steps. Love it. Okay, what is a holy idea in the pursuit of one's dreams and goals? Yeah, so um, I would think that never relenting and always staying focused on your goals and just not allowing anybody to derail you from your purpose. If you believe something deeply and you want to accomplish it and you believe that you can, don't let anybody tell you you can't. Just go out there and believe it and do it and start walking it out. Um, listen, if I had if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me I was a failure, I failed in school. I used to take fundamentals of math because I couldn't do division. My teachers used to tell me I was stupid. If I had listened to those teachers, oh, I would not be the millionaire entrepreneur I am today. So don't listen to the negative people in your life. Just go after it. Love it. Okay, and finally, the most divine idea you can think of. Wow. So I think that um, learning that we are loved by God and embracing the divinity of who he is in us and the power that comes with that in our life and our daily living is so important. Um, you know, God wants us to embrace divinity. Um, and if your, your listeners don't know what that means, Google the word divine divinity, and you'll find out it's a superpower. It's, it's, a, a, you know, an all powerful, you know, God, and we, we should embrace the divinity in us because it's Christ in us. And, and, and that's an everyday life, not just when you need a miracle, but every day in your life, embrace the divinity of who God created you to be and, and that you are loved by God very dearly. Love it. Rebecca Contreras, lost girl from the hood to the White House, to millionaire entrepreneur. Thank you so much for being on the show, Rebecca. And thank you, Boss Media, for pitching you know, the, the book to me. I think this has been phenomenal. There has been so much insight. Where do you want to point people to to find more about the type of work you do or yeah, so get I, to know I you? Want, uh, I want people to subscribe to my website at RebeccaContreras.com. Send me an, an email. Let me know that you listened and how you were encouraged. I want to hear from you. Uh, you can also get the book on the website and I can personalize it if you buy it off the website. Of course, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and all the other online providers as well. But uh, yeah, connect with me also on Instagram at Rebecca Ann Contreras, the middle, middle name Ann, and on Facebook at Rebecca Ann Contreras. I'd love to stay in touch with you and, and hear from you. I do put out a lot of content and a lot of words of encouragement. So once you connect with me on social media, you'll be, you'll be a part of that. But thank you, Beto, for having me. Enjoy the chat. Love it. Thank you so much, Rebecca. 
And I'll see you guys on the next one. Make sure you visit us at christianpodcast.com. You can find our emoji merch. You can find in-depth of our episodes and links to all of our social media platforms. I'll see you guys on the next one. Okay, from Latino to Latino, let's dance it out. Love it. <laughs> Love it.